Hello, my name is Eric Engstrom. Uh, welcome to the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources Atlas Orientation. Again, my name is Eric Engstrom. I'm the GIS Project Supervisor here at the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources, uh, the developer of the Natural Resources Atlas. Here's the brief outline of the um, webinar that we'll be going through today. Um, we'll be identifying the atlas layout first and foremost. We'll go over the map area. We'll talk about the map components um, that are found within the um, mapping section of the website. We'll also go over all of the map layers. We can talk about all of the toolbars as well. I'm going to show you the quick tools and how to use them, um, specifically the zoom to town, the find an address, we're going to print a map, and we're going to extract some data. We're also going to go over each of the toolbars and the tabs within them, including the getting around tab, which has the pan, zoom, export, print, and help options. The upload and draw tab, which uh, allows users to upload map layers, including shape files, as well as markup. I'm also going to talk about the identify query tools. We're going to do some identifying and um, we're going to query some features within the map layer. And we're also going to do some measuring. And finally, I'll show you how to save and or load your map. So this series is all part of our Map Simply campaign. And what that means is um, we're looking to um, reduce the amount of um, GIS users that are so heavily invested in, in expensive and complex ArcGIS mapping programs. We're developing web applications at little to no cost to you so that we can provide this information in a useful, efficient manner, thus reducing cost, overhead, and staff time in supporting those complex GIS mapping programs. So um, the Natural Resources Atlas is a delivery of um, one of these easy to use, high performance mapping applications that allow users to simply create a map and do so um, without much overhead. Now I don't know if anybody's <clears throat> familiar with this current slide, but this is an ArcIMS web mapping application. Um, when I first started here at the Agency of Natural Resources in 2004, this is what we had to work with. Now this isn't an Agency of Natural Resources website, but this is the layout of an ArcIMS web mapping application not too flashy. However, you know, it did get the job done. There were some specific tools that allowed us to do some querying. We were able to see a map and we were able to do it on the web, which was um, kind of a new upcoming um, mechanism for delivering mapping. No longer did we have to purchase expensive map software to deliver a map to, say, a public or a user of GIS information. However, now we have the Natural Resources Atlas, and you know you can already tell how things have become so much more integrated within the mapping environment. You know our, our mapping tools are, are hidden, and we can we can expand them efficiently. You can see all the map layers as well as the legend, <coughs> all at the same time. Uh, we also have new updated imagery services that were allowed to integrate into our mapping components now. So sub mapping subscriptions have been um, very huge in, in creating um, great mapping applications. And you know, I've, I've got a lot of emails from people asking me, you know, Eric, you know, the environmental interest locator, it did what I needed it to do. It, I was able to find my data, I was able to print a map and, and be done with it. But this new atlas, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, so I, I like to quote the I like to quote Wayne Gretzky where he says, you know, I skate to where the puck is going to be, and not where it has been. So our focus at v Vermont Agency of Natural Resources GIS Department is to stay up to date with our GIS mapping software to enhance our mapping program. Now it is going to require a little overhead by getting used to newer tools, but I feel like these new applications provide so much more um, efficiency and performance and greater capabilities that um, we need to go where technology is leading us. 
Now, Steve Jobs also had his own quote. He says, my job is not to be easy on people. My job is to make them better. And I feel that same way with the Agency of Natural Resources Atlas. A lot of people said, this, this application is so difficult. I don't understand it. I don't know what I'm looking at anymore. I used to be so good with the interest locator, and I think this site is just way too difficult. I'm never going to figure it out. Well, nobody said this was going to be easy. I know that over the years, you know, back three, four, maybe even five years ago, we introduced the environmental interest locator, and people have made it their baby. Um, it's what people do now. It's what had people had become used to. And change is never easy on people. I can attest to that. But we have to trust me. You know, my job is not going to be easy on you in this particular case, but it will make you better. The Natural Resources Atlas is going to make you a better map, quicker, with better data, and more up-to-date information with less downtime. So get some familiarity, ask me questions, I'm here to help you, but I do believe that you know this transition is not going to be easy on a lot of people, but it is going to be for the better. So now I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to jump right into the application. I'm going to reload it, make a fresh new app here. <clears throat> and here we are. So feel free to follow along. Um, one of the first things you'll probably want to do is to turn off your pop-up blocker for this particular site. Um, some people have asked me, hey, I've created an image or I printed a map and when I click to open the file, nothing happened. Well, it's probably because you missed the message that said that your pop-ups were being blocked. So it's very important to make sure your pop-up blockers are turned off and you only have to do it for this particular site. You don't need to turn it off completely. So here we are. <clears throat> this is our application layout. Over on the right hand side you see um, the map area and before we even do anything we already have the capability of navigating this particular map. I can double click it to zoom in. If you have a scroll wheel on your mouse you can scroll up to zoom in or scroll down to zoom out. To pan you simply click and drag the map. You can drag it left, right, up or down and you can also um, right click on the particular map so if I'm if I right click on the map I'm actually presented with a few different options I can center the map at any given point so if I want to center the map on this baseball field here I can right click and choose to center here or I want to center my map back on the this used to be the state agency's horseshoe so I can center it there um, if I had some map layers turned on, I could choose what's here. And basically what that's going to do is provide you with a quick and easy way of identifying um, a particular layer. So if I had something turned on and I click right-clicked on it and shows what here, it would give me a result over here in the results list. I can, I can draw a point, and I can even give some text. So I'm going to add some text over here and say field by a and R. <clears throat> I can also export this map as an image like I just said. Um, we can select in different formats. I'm going to choose a JPEG here and what this is going to do is export the map area only. This isn't going to format with a title or a legend or anything but if you want a quick and painless way of um, providing someone with an image of the map that you're looking at, this is a quick and easy way to do it. So choose your format and choose create image. It's going to say that the image is, is ready to open in just a minute and when we do that, we're going to click that button and it's going to open up a new window with our image in it. So let's view the image. So from here I can right click and I can just copy this image and paste it into an email if I so choose. I can save it to my computer or you can send somebody the, the URL to the image. However, it is pointing to a temporary location and I'm not sure what that timeout limit is, but um, I would either save it or, or copy the image and, and paste it into a, a Word document or email, etc. So um, 
Another cool function that I'm not so sure it'll get used um, entirely too often, but it is kind of a neat enhancement. We can right click on any port point of a road and choose to open the Google Street View there. So in this case, I'm opening up the Google Street View um, right in front of the, the horseshoe here at A&R. So I'm looking at the green um, and the hydrant. It doesn't actually look to be a very nice day, but um, it's just kind of a neat way to be able to familiarize yourself with the area. Now, you can still do this, um, you know, say in the middle of Camel's Hump State Forest or, or Camel's Hump Park. But um, you're not going to see a whole lot there, so um, just keep in mind you'll probably want to do this along a, a street in order for it to be um, valuable to you. Over on the bottom right hand corner of the map is um, an arrow, and what this does is it opens up the overview map with a simple gray base map. And you click that arrow again to close it. At the top right corner of the application, um, you can open or close the toolbar. So if I open that up, it's going to expose all of the tools that I'm going to be going through in this particular webinar. So we'll come back to all of those, but that's how you open it. <clears throat> in the other corner, just next to our quick tools, is the hide information pane, which, which essentially is just hiding the map layers. So if you want to maximize your mapping area, you can choose to close all of those map area, or the map layers and then you get a nice big map that you can pan around and, and look at. So I'm going to open it back up though. And just to the right of that is our quick tools and this is like our little craftsman toolbox for all of you now this includes a bunch of different tools that allows you to do certain tasks within the application and I think that um, we'll get into these in further in the demo but um, it, these are all of this is an assembly of a bunch of tools that I think the users will use most often Back over near the um, open tools is the Atlas Layers button. And what this allows us to do is change the base map of what we're looking at. So right now we're looking at the Microsoft Bing base map, which is actually the Bing hybrid, which includes both the color ortho photos, or the cor color aerial imagery, as well as the roads and labels. It also has um, some various political boundaries that uh, that it, that it will display. So this is a nice little base map that um, kind of serves a lot of purposes. But this drop down allows us to change these base maps. So if you're interested in looking at the black and white orthos, say maybe you're a fish and wildlife biologist and are looking at habitat, or a wetland ecologist and you're know, looking at wet areas, some of those areas are easier to identify using the black and white ortho photos. They are included in this particular application. You can also change to the U.S. topographic map. Now these are an assembly of the 1 to 24K and 1 to 100K. I believe they're the USGIS or USGS topo. So um, depending on how far you're zoomed in, you'll be seeing the 1 to 24K topos. And if I the further out I zoom, um, it'll switch over to the 1 to 100K. And you know further out, um, it sh it switches map scale. So um, pretty handy topo tool that is very fast and um, has a lot of function to it. And lastly is the gray canvas base map. Now I don't know how much use this will get but um, basically what it is is it's just a gray backdrop that has some limited um, roads, limited labels, etc. But what makes this a nice base map is say you have some GIS data that you want to display thematically that is nice, you know, has a nice color backdrop to it, or you've got a nice border outline and fill, you know, where it's, you know, mapped thematically by, um, by color. Those colors tend to really pop against this gray base map. You know, I think the Bing base map can drown out a lot of data. So um, if you're interested in viewing data that is colored or symbolized by color, you might want to use this gray canvas base map. So it's kind of a neat alternative. Now below these base maps is our map, are our map themes. So I'm going to get into these map themes here in, in just a minute. Um, because I'm going to segue over to our map layers section. So one of the cool new things with the Natural Resources Atlas is these 
or are these map themes. Now, we're currently default as using an Atlas Layers theme. Now, this is going to include most of the data layers that were included with the um, environmental interest locator, so pretty much all of our data. However, if I choose the Rivers Management theme, you notice that it changed the base map. It added the Rivers Management um, data group, which was not present in the ANR Atlas Layers, and turned on all of their relevant information. So immediately, we just created a whole new application within the Natural Resources Atlas. The Stream Geomorphic Assessment Group within the, the Rivers Management Program had their own web application that basically just did this. You know, it had their data in it, it had them turned on, and it had it um, symbolized the way they liked it. <clears throat> but by using the Rivers Management theme, we've now incorporated multiple program websites or web mapping applications into a single source. So we only have to modify or make changes to a single spot now, which makes, if it makes it highly efficient and uh, is a one-stop shop for all of these layers. And they can also see all of these layers with the ANR um, Atlas data as well. So similarly, you know, we also have a water wells theme. So what this is going to do is it's going to turn on the private wells we're also going to see some groundwater source protection areas. This is a groundwater classification layer here, and here's our groundwater source protection area. So if I expand the drinking water and groundwater protection um, layer group just by clicking the, the plus here and expanding all of the, the layers within it, you'll see that the surface water source protection area, the groundwater source protection area, and the groundwater classification layers are turned on. And they are turned on indicated by the check marks. So it's kind of trivial, but these check marks indicate that the layer is turned on. If a layer is grayed out, like I've got some emails from people who have said, hey, you know, the, the layer is grayed out. How, why, why is that happening? Well, it's usually because the map is zoomed too far out. Now, what that means is that there's scale dependent scale dependencies set on a lot of these layers so that, you know, say that we're zoomed out to the state, we don't want to show all of the 100,000 private wells at the statewide scale. Now, your computer isn't going to like you and our server isn't going to like me by having to display that much data on a statewide scale. So we have these scale dependencies to turn off these data layers when they're not zoomed in to the, pri um, to the proper level. So if I click on the private wells layer in here, I can choose this zoom to visible scale option and that's going to bring me down to the correct scale for which these layers uh, will turn on. There's our private wells. <clears throat> if I use this transparency scale slider, this is going to make all of the layers that are turned on more transparent in the map. Now, this makes more sense when we have um, we have some polygon layers that are turned on. Let me turn on some soils data here. <clears throat> if I zoom in, I can use this transparency um, slider. Which is kind of helpful. Now, <clears throat> it seems basic, but these check marks indicate whether these these layers are turned on or off. So I can go ahead and I can turn you know the hydric layers back off. <clears throat> Excuse me. A neat feature within the maps layers is this filter down at the bottom, and what this allows me to do is type in um, certain things. So I can type in permit to retrieve all of the layers within the layer list that have permit in the name. Similarly, I can choose water, which is going to bring up all of our water related data layers. So what that means is it's just searching the, the layer name for any of these filters in here. So um, just kind of a quick and easy way to, to access layers that you might have trouble finding. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn on the waste management theme. What this is going to do is it's going to turn on our, our hazardous waste uh, or our waste management data layers, which include things like our hazardous waste sites, hazardous waste generators, etc. Um, I'm going to click the hazardous waste site, and I'm going to show you a cool new feature with this application. We can now symbolize these layers however we want. Um, 
most layers um, provide this option. So all of our um, simple rendered um, layers are re um, symbolizable. I don't, know if, <laughs> I don't know if that's a word or not, but if you guys hate how I'm symbolizing any of these particular layers within the layer list, um, click the layer and then click the layer symbol button. And what this is going to do, it's going to allow us to change our symbolization uh, symbol shape. So we can change this to a circle. We can change it to a square, cross, or a diamond. So I'm going to keep it a circle. Um, we can change it to the color to, say, red, and our border color to, to blue. We can even give the outline of the color a little bit um, and choose OK. So as you can see, it changed the, the symbol for that particular layer, which is, which is helpful. If you have um, GIS projects where you're symbolizing things a certain way and you don't like how I'm doing it, then go ahead and do it yourself. <laughs> um, however, um, in this current release, we're not able to change the symbols of, um, say, you know, if something symbolized by a category, an attribute table, or a quantity, um, we're not able to, to change those symbols as of yet. But in a future release, that will actually be possible. So um, stay tuned for that. All right, I'm going to get into the, the quick tools now. Um, that's, that's your little craftsman toolbox up here in the upper left-hand corner. Um, what the first tool in this quick tools is allows us to, to zoom to a particular town. Um, so if I type in the first uh, couple layers, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a fresh new application. So I'm going to reload this one here. <coughs> and use the quick tools and zoom to a particular town. Um, don't freak out. You don't have to know how to spell all of the towns in Vermont. Uh, if you start typing in the first couple letters of a particular town, it's going to start uh, filtering those towns for you. So if I type in W-I-L, you know, L, so it's, it's, it starts filtering it down. So then I can go ahead and click on Williston and, and, and choose OK. So there's Williston. So we're, we're kind of drilling down to our particular area, and I'm using this as kind of a workflow for, I think, that some people might, um, might follow. Um, so once we get to the particular town, we might want to um, search for, for an actual address. So I'm going to search for one library lane in Williston, and it's going to default to the state, and we don't need to provide the zip code. So um, just the, the address in the, in the city is, is sufficient. I'm going to go ahead and choose um, search. And um, we, get a, we get a list of results here. Now, uh, I know that you can see that some results have different scores, and that's just based off of how well it matches that particular address. So we have a score of 100. It's our first um, layer in the list, and it found it at one library lane. What we can do is we can click the star, and that's going to select that particular location so that it doesn't um, remove when I go in and do other um, do other th things within the application. So if I unselect it, you can see that that point goes away. Um, also within the results these are all these globes here, and those aren't just for show. If you click on that globe, it's actually going to zoom to that particular location and bring up a dialog that um, lets users know um, what that particular location is. And that works for all results, whether it's an identifier, query, etc. Um, this geocoding or this address search is essentially doing a query on the layer. Um, and, and we we're able to, to zoom and add those things to a selection set just like we would any other feature. <clears throat> the, next, uh, the next tool is our search layers. And this is like a Google search for all of our GIS layers. And this, this tool kind of amazes me that um, we can just type in something like Williston Central. I know this is Williston Central School. This is where I, I grew up and learned to play baseball and, and all sorts of things. So um, I know that this is Williston Central School, and I want to find GIS features that match um, this particular location or this particular um, feature that I'm, I'm looking at. So using the... the uh, the search layers, I just typed in Williston Central School, and this goes in and searches all of our attributes within our GIS layers and returns anything that has Williston Central in it. Um, so right off the bat, we, we find that there's a hazardous waste site at the particular location, and you know don't get too, uh, 
don't get too alarmed. There, there are certain you know hazardous waste sites that um, it doesn't mean that it's glowing or anything like that. But um, if we want to find additional details about this particular site, we can click any of these records and or or view the site details. So. I'm going to go ahead and, and click that record and we see that it's a hazardous waste site and we have a hyperlink for this particular layer that's actually going to link you to the report. However, we can also view the attributes for this particular um, query. So this is returning all of the attributes for that particular GIS layer. So I can go back to details and um, I can choose to, to link to this particular report and this is actually going to bring me to the hazardous waste site application where I can get more information about this site and also um, I can view other points of interest and if there are um, documents etc associated with this hazardous waste site I can see those as well which is kind of neat. Um, The next tool is uh, the print map, and I know there are a lot of people who are interested in, well actually, there are a lot of people um, learning how to print a map and had a lot of questions on how to print the map. Um, so if I go to, I'm going to go back to the map layers and I'm going to turn on the hazardous waste site layer here. And I'm going to choose to print a map. There are multiple layout options. We have an 8.5 by 11 landscape map. We also have an 11 by 17 landscape map. Both of these options use meters as our, um, as our scale. So um, I had a request from a few people. Um, a lot of consultants use feet in their maps. So the, the difference between these top two maps and the bottom two uh, map layouts is one uses meters and, and one uses feet. So um, I'm going to choose an 8.5 by 11 landscape map in feet. Um, the output format, we have one option. Uh, we have a PDF. I do believe we have other options for the meters. So I'll have to fix that for you. But if I choose um, landscape feet, um, we have two different resolution options. We have a 96 DPI, which is our standard resolution. We also have a 150 DPI high resolution map. So for the purposes of this demo, I'm just going to choose a standard resolution. And we have different scale options. Now, <clears throat> there are some questions about map scale. And um, I won't get into the details of it because you know we're, we're using a different coordinate system than the state standard, the Vermont State Plane Coordinate System. We're actually using a Web Mercator coordinate system, which actually works off of a grid, or excuse me, a, a latitude and longitude that spans the entire Earth. So what that means is you know we're kind of halfway between the equator and the North Pole, so we 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 see a lot of measurement distortion. So we have to do some reprojections on the fly. So it makes custom map scales uh, pretty difficult to, to create in this application. So um, we have the default option is the current extent. And what that's going to do is it's going to preserve your map area from your screen and transfer it directly to your printed map. So it adjusts the scale to account for your extent. Now the current scale is going to preserve the scale in your map but adjust the extent for, to your printed map to match the scale between your screen and your printed map. And then we also have preset options. We can print a 1 to 24,000 K map, but uh, what that's going to do is it's going to adjust the map area in your printed map so it's not exactly what you're going to be seeing on your screen. So I'm going to go ahead and choose current extent and uh, I'm going to give this a title. I'm going to call this Williston Central as site and give it some notes, notes for the demo and then I'm going to choose create file. Now this is going to go to our server and tell our server which uh, layers we have turned on, which base map, etc. Um, and then I can go ahead and choose to open that particular file. So there's our map. This is what we created. Um, we've got our map area over here. We can see our, our title. We've got an inset map over here, our legend notes, etc. So um, what we can do now is we can save this to our computer and we can send it to someone as an attachment. We can go ahead and we can directly print it or we can close it and we can, we can start fresh and, and, and do something else. So the flexibility is there. 
um, if we're interested in the data, we're not actually interested in creating a map, we just want the data. Um, I created a tool called Extract the GIS Data. And what this allows us to do is select data from that is available in the Natural Resources Atlas and download that data so that we can use it in, say, an ArcGIS application. So um, we say we're interested in our hazardous waste sites, and there was an under, I think there was an underground storage tank in the area. So I'm going to hold the control key down and select the layers that I'm interested in in, um, in returning or getting back. Um, there is an upload or a, uh, an extraction limit. I believe it's five megabytes. So you're not going to be able to get all of the private wells for the entire state by using this tool. It's going to say, uh, uh that's too big. Um, so just keep that in mind. This is this is pretty much a project-based um, tool. I mean, we we can't have uh, performance hits from you know, a lot of people downloading all this information all at the same time. So. Um, Few layers at a time. You know, you can you could probably extract townwide data. That's probably acceptable, um, depending on what you're downloading. Um, this next option is to um, define the geometry that we're going to use to extract the data. We can use our current map area, which is going to take the outer boundary of our current map area and use that as our clip function, or we can define custom geometry by using either the rectangle or the polygon tool. I'm just going to go ahead and, and click around this particular area because I know that's where I want to extract my data. And then choose next. And the next, <coughs> the next um, dialog is asking us what format we want this in. Um, I know everybody's probably going to go jump straight to the shape file because that's what everybody's familiar with, but I urge you to, to uh, kind of resist that urge and um, choose the file geo database, and here's why. The file geo database is going to preserve the aliases that I've set up and all of the attribute tables for our layers. So in layers like, um, I like to use the habitat blocks as an, al as a, as an example, that the fields in the habitat blocks layer are, are very cryptic. So when you first open that layer, you're probably not going to understand what field is what by choosing the shape file. But if you have the file geo database, you'll see all those fields as the alias. So it makes it a little bit easier to, to use that data. So um, if you have the capability, choose file geo database. Also, um, what you need to do now is, is enter your email address. So I'm just going to go ahead and type in my email address and click finish. <clears throat> and this goes to the server. It uses that area to clip out those GIS features. It's going to package those into a file geo database for me and then in create a zip file from that file geo database and then email that to me. So should if I'm going to close this right now, uh, I don't have my Outlook open because I didn't want any distractions during the presentation, but I'm pretty positive right now that I have a, an email in my inbox with that GIS data I just extracted. So, Pretty cool tool. Um, allows you to use the site to extract data that you need for, for any projects that you might have. Um, we can also run a private well report. I know a lot of people use this site for, for private wells, and what this does is, uh, if I back out a little bit, it's going to turn on the private wells, um, and it's going to allow me to let's go to let's go somewhere interesting here uh, down Oak Hill Road here. Um, <clears throat> it's going to allow me to draw a polygon around some private wells that I'm interested in. Say I want the uh, private wells at the top of Partridge Hill here in Williston. I draw my polygon, single clicks, and I double click to finish it, and it'll say geometry is captured, and then click submit. Now this report can be delivered in either an Excel table or a PDF report. And this is going to give me all of the attributes for the private wells um, that I have selected within my polygon. So um, I'm going to go ahead and choose a, a PDF report because I want to get the information based off of uh, those wells in a, in a report. So what it does is it selects those wells, it sends it to our server, extracts out the attributes, places them in the PDF report, and also includes a little inset map. So when I choose um, download well report, when the dialog um, is presented and says that it's ready, I'm able to open this PDF document that highlights the particular well. So this is the well we're looking at right here and has all of the information for that particular well within the PDF. So 
That's page one. Page two shows this well with all of the information for it. In, in page three has this third well. So it's just a quick and easy way to extract out that um, private well data, and I know that it's popular, so I wanted to make that tool available. So I'm going to choose close, and it's going to ask me whether I want to clear my markup. So um, what that means is we created a drawing for these particular wells. So if I want to preserve that drawing because I'm, I'm ready to make a map as well, I can choose cancel, and it'll allow me to keep that drawing for future use. If I click OK, it's just going to delete it. So um, I'm not interested in printing a map right now, so I'm going to click OK and, um, and, and close that out. Now the two last quick tools are the open and close toolbar, which I just showed you. This allows you to open or close the particular toolbar. <clears throat> and the last is, the, is to show the map layers. Now our last tool um, returned a result for the selection of those three wells that we just uh, created a polygon around. So this final tool is the show map layers. So that brings us back to all of our, our map layers. Um, and there are multiple different buttons that allow you to do that. If we look down at the bottom of the map layers section, we kind of have a, it's like a Microsoft start menu down here. We have um, the results of our advanced, or the advanced search window, and we also have our results window. So if we click these buttons, we kind of um, move back and forth between our processes that we've actually done during this session. So it's kind of a quick way to toggle between those views. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So that brings up uh, the toolbar. So I'm going to open up the toolbar here, and we'll discuss the getting around um, tab. So again, here's that show layers button. It's it's everywhere, but uh, I think it's important because I think people can get lost in in their um, in their workflows. So it's important to have a button that brings you back to where you're familiar. <coughs> Also, um, the next button is the layer drawing order button. Now, this button allows you to change the layer drawing order like you do uh, for those that are um, familiar with ArcGIS. It allows you to adjust which layers appear on top of each other. So if you find that a particular layer is turning on um, and covering uh, a particular layer, then this application allows you to to adjust for that. So if I turn on, say, the hydric soils and say the prime ag soils, we ha we have some some layering issues going on here. So we know that our hydric soils are are covering up our our prime ag soils and also our um our and also our groundwater source protection information. So if I choose the layer drawing order, I can change the order or the uh, the layering of our base maps, but furthermore, if I choose the edit button on the ANR Atlas layers, it allows me to change the order of all of the layers within that particular service. So if I want the groundwater source protection area information to draw on top of the soils, I can drag it to the top and it's going to draw that on top of those soils layers for me because it has some transparency set from the beginning. Um, similarly, I, if I want my prime ag soils to draw on top of the hydric soils, I can click and drag to make sure that those are drawing on top of the hydric soils. So <clears throat> no more are the issues with um, layers covering other layers. This is something that's new with the Atlas and is kind of a cutting edge product from ArcGIS Server that was certainly not available in the environmental interest locator. So that's pretty exciting. <clears throat> the next tool is the print map. Um, we've been through that, so I won't show that again. Um, we've also exported a map image. Um, those are the same tools that are found within your quick tool, so there's no real need to get into those. Um, the pan tool, zoom tools, um, all pretty self-explanatory. Um, the pan tool works just the same way. You know, if I click it, I can click the map and then drag it. That zoom, uh, excuse me, that pans the particular map. The zoom tool, I can draw a rectangle and uh, allows me to um, zoom into a particular location. 
<coughs> same with the zoom out tool. There's also the zoom to town tool that's also found in that uh, quick tools section, so you can use that. There's a full extent button. That's going to bring us right back to the state. This is the full extent of our data. And then there's a previous extent button. So if you want to go back to where you were, uh, use the previous extent button. Now, <clears throat> the help tools are not specific to the atlas. They're specific to the application that runs the atlas. So if we choose the show help topics, that's going to bring up the help for Geocortex Essentials. But that doesn't mean that it's not helpful. It's extremely helpful. There's a search window up here, so if you're having trouble with using any of the tools or finding where those tools are and how they work, um, be sure to use this online help because it is extremely helpful. Um, Similarly, this What's This tool is also pretty neat. Like, if I click the What's This tool, I can choose something, well, if, let's click in the Quick Tools. Um, they call it the I Want To menu. We call it the Quick Tools, but it's the same thing. Um, so it brings up that application-specific help um, by just clicking on features within the map. So that's pretty neat. Um, there's a contact us form, so be sure to use this if you're having trouble using the site or if you're, you have any comments, if you want to say, Eric, dude, this, this application is amazing, you know, I like to hear that sort of thing. So uh, be, sure to, be sure to submit that stuff to me because uh, it does help drive um, motivation and, and help keep this product alive. So um, I do appreciate hearing from everyone. Um, and then there's a disclaimer button. So if I click this, it's just going to bring up the Agency Natural Resources Atlas uh, disclaimer, which you have all read. I know you have. So um, you probably don't need to read it again. But if you haven't re read it, please do. Um, that's all I'll have to say about that. So that's the Getting Around tab. Um, pretty basic stuff, but some powerful things in the layer drawing order. Obviously, um, printing a map is, is pretty neat as well. So I'm going to jump to the upload tools and um, extremely powerful stuff in here. Um, the first tool is our add map layer tool. And what this does is allows us to add map services that are published both here at the Agency of Natural Resources and also in other agencies. Um, currently, I preload a lot of the Vermont Center for Geographic Information map services, um, and they have some pretty cool imagery services that are coming out, which are actually consumable in the Natural Resources Atlas. So for instance, um, right here, I mean, they have the, um, the NAEP color infrared um, imagery. So if I'm interested in use, um, viewing some of the map landscape using their color infrared imagery, <coughs> I can give that an alias. So I'll call it color infrared. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the wrong uh, coordinate system. So if you see that um, something is SP, that means it's in state plane. And we need to ensure that we're using map services that use Web Mercator. So um, also, I can filter all of these results by typing in things like VCGI um, up at the top. So we can consume their base map in Web Mercator. Um, they have their US topo cache in uh, Web Mercator. And I don't know, I thought I saw a color infrared version in Web Mercator. There it is. So here's the VCGI color infrared Web Mercator. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and, and add that to the map. So I'm sorry about that. It is a live demo. <laughs> so we'll give that an alias. And we'll finish it and close. <clears throat> so hopefully that gets added to our map. So pretty neat. Now we have color infrared imagery loaded here in the, in the Natural Resources Atlas. So that, that's, that's amazing to me. We're, we're doing this on the web. This isn't in even a desktop software package right now. We're doing some pretty powerful stuff. Um, and uh, we noticed that this particular layer was added on top of our Atlas layer, so that's not going to do. So we're going to need to go back to our Getting Around tab and change our layer drawing order. I'm going to put that on top of the Bing base map. We're not interested in, in Bing right now. We're interested in color infrared imagery. So now uh, I just changed the layer order, so our color infrared is on top of the Bing base map. And now we're viewing all of our Atlas layers um, let me change the theme here back to our Atlas layers. 
and turn on something like uh, well, here's some deer wintering areas. Make see if those turn on. <coughs> and what else? We can turn on some wetlands. Let's do that as well. So now we're viewing wetlands on top of color infrared imagery. And I can use that transparency slider to to see those particular features. So um, I don't know. It, it, it gets me kind of excited. I think it's really cool. Um, so back to the upload tools. Um, the next that I want to do is I want to add a shape file. Now, if anybody is using ArcGIS and wants to be able to use the Atlas at the same time, you know, export a, a, a simple shape file. Now, there is a 5 megabit upload limit, and it does kind of cough at really complex geometries, but I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to add a shape file here, and it's going to bring up the dialog, and I'm going to go to the folder for which I have stored my, my shape file. And um, really important to note here that a shape file is not just a single file. It's a series of files. Um, a shape file, or the Atlas is going to look for the three main components of your shape file. There's the SHP file that stores your geometry. There's the PRJ file that stores your projection information. And then there's also the DBF file that stores the attributes for your particular shape file. Now we need to select all three of these to add it to the Atlas and have it perform uh, appropriately. Uh, I had a lot of people ask me, Eric, I uploaded a shapefile and it ended up in India. What, what happened? Well, it's probably because you didn't include the projection information and it didn't know where to put that, those weird coordinates that you had in that table. So that projection information will tell it where it needs to go and what those coordinates mean, so make sure you include it. Um, hold the control key down or your shift key or whatever and uh, select all of those files and then choose to open it. And that is going to add this particular shape file <clears throat> as a graphic layer within the map. So you say, well, nothing happened. Well, it did happen. It uploaded, but we need to click on it, or right click on it, excuse me, um, and, and go to it. So I'm going to zoom to my particular extent. And we can see that my shape file loaded as uh, GMNF, and that's the Green Mountain National Forest. So I'm going to right click and zoom to this particular extent. <clears throat> and I'm going to turn off our color infrared imagery. So cool. So here's our shape file. Um, it's loaded up on our map. Um, it's kind of a weird red, um, but have no fear. We can symbolize it. Uh, we can change the the border color. So we'll give it a we'll give it a dark green color and give it some give it a like a grayish fill. We're just kind of interested in knowing where it is and where the boundaries are. So. Um, we also have a transparency slider for it, so I can adjust this transparency. Um, and it also transparency is also set for the symbol, symbol, so I can change the transparency here as well. <clears throat> so um, let's, we've already zoomed to the extent. We've changed the transparency. We've um, so let's um, move on. We can move on to the uh, CSV file. Um, it's between the add shape file and add CSV file, it, it adds great mechanisms for uploading GPS information. So if you have a Garmin or you're using DNR Garmin, export it as a shape file and then you can add it directly to the Atlas. Or if you have just a, a simple unit or, or something that just contains an X and a Y location in, within a, you know, like a waypoint table, you can use the add CSV file. So just save those. Um, tables as a CSV and ensure that there's an X and Y location field in it or a spatial column, you can use this CSV file to upload those waypoints to this particular map. So I'm going to choose the Green Mountain National Forest geodetic um, CSV file. So this is just a table and I'm going to go ahead and add it to the map. And um, what these are, they're geodetic points that I exported as a table that have a lot long in them. So I can zoom in here. I'm gonna adjust my transparency a little bit, and um, so those those show up in the map. So um, GPS information totally uploadable in the Natural Resources Atlas. And uh, similarly, we can we can symbolize these points as well. So if I want to change this to a, a black triangle, I can do that by clicking on the layer in the layer list. 
I can make these triangles a little bit smaller, choose OK. So again, click on the layer in the layer list and choose Symbolize Layer. I can also remove it as well. So let's go to the Water Wells theme because <clears throat> I'm going to move on to the upload, or excuse me, the draw tools of the upload draw tab. Um, these are pretty self-explanatory. I'm going to kind of motor through these. Um, you can add a point. You can change the color of these points just like you do the different symbologies. Um, you can draw a rectangle. You can change the rectangle uh, border color and the fill um, and, and draw that on the map. Um, you can do other different types of shapes, circle, triangles, etc. Um, you can edit the drawing by choosing to edit. Click on it. <clears throat> and then um, it's going to bring up the vertices for that particular um, polygon. I can also erase the drawing by clicking the Erase Drawing tool, and I can erase those. Um, I want to show something that's cool about the text. And if I want, I can change the, the text. Uh, I can change the color of the text. I'm going to leave it black. It might make it a little bit smaller. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write some text here um, over by Lincoln Peak. And um, you can type in anything you want. Um, or I can type in Lincoln Peak if I want, hit enter, and it shows up. But also what I can do is I can hit the ellipse that's at the end, which brings up the advanced label options. This allows me to add a feature label to my particular text. So I don't know, that was kind of quick, but I hit the ellipsis, um, and then it brings up the add feature label. And this, what this does is it finds any features that are turned on at that particular location and lists them in the layer, and then allows me to label that particular text with the value for a feature that was, um, that was clicked on. So in this particular case, there's a surface water, groundwater source protection area, I want to include the water system ID to my label. So I can choose add to label and then it adds that particular water system ID to it. So I'm not interested in um, saying water system ID, but I can apply that water system ID um, to the particular text. So um, something pretty cool to check out. Um, also there's, there's clear all drawings and really just use this if, if you're sure that you want to remove everything from your map. So. Um, just something to keep in mind. Okay, so we're getting a little tight on time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna motor right on to the identify query tools. Um, hopefully, I'm not going too fast, but this is being recorded. I hit the record button a little late, so you're gonna have to forgive me that I might have cut off the beginning. But um, this will be made available on our site. Um, so identify query has has the most. Um, probably the most familiar identify tool um, similar to the environmental interest locator but what we don't have to do this time is make a, a layer active now what the identify tool is going to do is it's going to identify anything that's turned on so I'm gonna switch back to our um, waste management theme <coughs> And ramp up the, the transparency. Um, I'm interested in identifying this, this point right here. I want to know what it is. So I choose the point identify tool and click right on the point and it's going to bring up results at that particular location. So we see that there's a hazardous waste site and also an underground storage tank. So they must be right on top of each other. So if I zoom in a little bit further, I'll probably start seeing the outline of the underground storage tank in here. So. <coughs> Once I, once I identify, I can bring up these results, and we kind of went through how to view the results, but you just click on it in the results window. You can bring up the details. You can search the attributes. Um, you can open up this report um, for those hazardous waste sites. Same with the underground storage tanks. Um, this is a facility ID 706, the Sugarbush Resort, um, and I can bring up the attributes for all those features. Um, one neat thing about the results window is I'm able to copy this particular feature to my drawing list. So if I want to use this later for um, maybe doing some editing um, by, or a drawing, etc., I can choose to copy that feature to the list, and it's going to add that to a drawing in, in my layer list here. So if I turn these off, I should see um, that particular point added in my map.
So um, it's cool with um, polygons. If you copy those uh, results of those polygons to uh, to your drawing, you can trace them by holding the control key down if you're doing some um, some editing. So um, that's pre a pretty neat feature. Um, I know I had some questions about um, the identify by radius not being included in this tool or in this application, and it is. Um, this buffered identify um, feature right here, uh, if that's checked, what this is going to do is allow us to click on a portion of the map using the point identify tool, and we can enter in a distance. So I'm interested in identifying all visible features within 1,000 feet of where I clicked. And I can add that buffer to the markup. I can preview it. <coughs> and then just go ahead and click OK. Now what this is doing is it identified all of those particular features within that 1,000 foot buffer. And that works for all of these identify tools. I can identify a buffer on a polygon or even on a rectangle. So um, kind of a neat feature that allows you to do that uh, particular functionality that was available in the interest locator. It's just in a different spot. And keep in mind that it's only identifying layers that are turned on, so anything that's visible in the map. So just make sure that you expand your layer groups and turn on those layers that you need to identify. We've been through the find features. That's our, our Google search form. Um, there's the find address. We've gone through that. There's also a simple query tool, which allows us to um, pick a query layer. So if I want to choose hazardous waste sites, that have a land use restriction. I can choose these drop downs. So these are all the attributes for the hazardous waste sites. So I use land use restriction equals, and then I can start typing in um, a value, and it actually knows um, what I'm going to be looking for. So if I type Y E S, I can choose yes and then run. Um, similarly, I can add query conditions, so if I'm interested in finding a place that has a land use restriction and um, has a priority that equals high or low, I can add that as a condition. So it's adding an AND condition to this query, and then I can go ahead and run it. So this is going to return all features that have a land use restriction and are high priority. So I can go ahead and use these features and, and zoom to them um, using the globe. Um, the view results is kind of the same um, tool as the show layers. Um, what this is going to do is, if I go to show my layers, um, I'm interested in going back to um, the results of my previous search. Uh, I can choose the, the view results. Similarly, if I have selections that I've made from my results, I can view all of my selected features. So currently, in my current section, I have three private wells that are selected, as well as three hazardous waste sites. So I can view those. Um, those selected features as well, or go back to my, my results. <clears throat> um, measurement tools. Um, these are all pretty straightforward, but also very powerful. Um, what I can do um, in my measurement toolbox is what I'm, I'm going to do first, I should say, is um, enter some coordinates. So this is basically your zoom to lat long tool. Uh, what this is going to do is go directly to where I need to go. So I'm going to type in my latitude, so 44, B471. My longitude, negative 72.7694. I have the option to add this coordinate to the map or pan to the particular coordinate. So I'm going to do both. I want to zoom to that location and I want to add that coordinate to the map. So I choose add and then done. And you can see exactly where I'm sitting, coming to you live from, right here in Waterbury. So um, just kind of a neat feature. Uh, if you know your location based off of, say, you have a well report or something and that you're looking at and you need to zoom to that location really quickly, you can choose the inner coordinates um, measurement here. 
Um, similarly, we can plot coordinates on the map. I had um, a well driller call me up the other day and said he was using Google Earth for getting coordinates on of the map for his well reports instead of using the GPS unit, which which is fine. I mean, uh, as long as you're you're ensuring accuracy, um, you can do that. But he was complaining that the format of the coordinates is not exactly what he needed. So. Uh, it was in degrees, minutes, seconds, and the well report requires lat long. Well, we can get around that by using this plot coordinates tool and by clicking on the map. So um, we'll, we'll create a hypothetical map over here on this little side field here. Um, and we can say our, our private well is right here. We can click on that particular location, and it's going to return the latitude and the longitude at that exact position. Now, if you need it in another format, you can choose degrees, minutes, seconds, and it will change that particular location right on the fly. Um, similarly, we have degrees in, in decimal minutes, but um, I like I like the decimal degrees, so we're gonna we're gonna keep it there. Um, we also have the measure tools over on the left that everybody's pretty familiar with. We can measure distances, so. Um, if we want to measure the, the distance of a particular location, we click the measure distance tool. We click once to start our line, and we double click to finish it. Or we can click once and, and traverse. So it's going to label each segment and also give us our total distance. So I'll double click to end. Um, and so our total distance here is 552 feet. Um, we can change those units to meters if we want, or miles, etc. Um, so we can we can do that. Now, if I go and need to measure another distance, it removes that last measurement, and that's not always desirable. Maybe we want to make multiple measurements. Now, what you can do is use the Add as Drawing button, and that's going to add that particular uh, measurement as a drawing on your drawing layers list. So I can go ahead and and create more drawings, or excuse me, more measurements. Um, similar, the uh, Measure Area tool. Um, allows me to measure an area. Um, I can click and, and get the outline of a particular property or um, maybe a parcel, an area of a parking lot, some impervious surface mapping, etc. Um, and I can get the perimeter in feet, meters, etc. and also the area in acres. It's default to acres and you can change it to square meters or square feet, etc. Um, and we can go ahead and add that as a drawing. Um, so pretty powerful measurement tools. Um, we can clear them um, by using the erase drawing. So I can erase this um, and erase my, my lines here. And then alternatively, there's the clear all option. Um, we can clear our coordinates just by clicking this. I'm, I'm just going to keep them. I think they look kind of neat. You guys can see where I am. Um, and the last tool within the measurement tab is our elevation profile. And this is kind of neat that allows us to visualize elevation based off of a line. So I'm just single clicking here, creating a line just like I did in the measurement tools. I'm going to double click. And what this is doing is it's sampling 100 points along that line that I just draw, drew, excuse me, and giving me the elevation for that line. So if I drag my cursor along this line, it shows me where that particular point is on the map, which is very neat. So you can see that there's a, a little bit of a steep incline here, and you can kind of see that in the map. Um, and you can return the elevation at that particular point. Now, a quick caveat. The distance is not accurate. This isn't using an accurate representation of the Web Mercator to Vermont State Plane coordinate system um, transformation. So um, what I recommend people doing is remeasuring their transect line. So if you have a um, if you need to get an accurate distance measurement, use the measure distance tool and go back and trace over that same transect line to get your accurate linear distance. However, the elevation in feet is accurate, so um, you can use uh, you can still use the elevation profile. It's just relative, um, as the distance is is not completely correct. <coughs> And um, I know we're running a little over time here. The last thing I want to cover is the, um, the save and um, open tools. So um, 
let's just create a little quick um, drawing here and um, so that we can come back to it. Say we, uh, we've we got our map, we've got it all labeled, we have our drawings, we have our parcels that are uploaded that we're interested in um, looking at, we've got our latitude and longitude of our particular location, we've got some measurements, etc. We want to save this, we want to come back to it and, and use it um, for further use. So what you can do is in the upper left hand corner just underneath the Vermont tab is use the save project tool. And what this is going to do is allow you to save a Geocortex Viewer for Silverlight project file to your local computer. And so I can call this anything I'd like. I'll call it um, Waterbury Office. <clears throat> and I can choose Save. Now this is going to save a GVSP file to your desktop. You're not going to be able to open that from your desktop. So you can't use Windows Explorer and double click on this thing and expect it to open up the map, etc. You're going to need to open it from the Natural Resources Atlas. So I'm going to go ahead and click Save, and it's going to ask for some information. I'm going to call this Waterbury Office, created by Eric for the demo, and choose OK. And now that's saved to my disk. So I'm going to just reload this application and go back to, to square one, just to kind of show you um, how this works, and similarly, how it doesn't work. So. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open up my toolbar. I'm going to use the open project. I'm going to go back to where I saved that GBSP file, double click on it, and what it's going to do is it's going to reload the application and reload all of my um, drawings and all my markup and um, anything that I might have added to the map previously, including um, other map services. And, uh, and there we go. So we're back to where we were. Um, we're back. We have our drawing here. Um, but some of you are probably scratching your head because, hey, that didn't work how it worked for my computer. When I opened up my project, I ended up somewhere in Canada. Well, it's a known bug. There is an issue with, um, I believe it has something to do with caching, but I haven't quite figured it out yet. But um, in some instances, when a project is reloaded, it doesn't always go back to the same location. But it is going to preserve all of the previous work that you've done in the application. So if you need to go back to that particular location, I recommend using the quick tools to zoom to the town that you are working in, and then you'll quickly notice that your graphics and your markup and all the layers that you had turned on for that particular location are still there. So. Um, there's no need to email me about that. I, I am aware of it, and uh, hopefully we'll fix that in a future release. Um, I don't know how, but it seemed to work in the webinar, and that never happens. It usually always fails in a webinar. So um, I'm going to leave on that note. So um, on a positive note, um, again, my name is Eric Angstrom. This is the demonstration or orientation of the Natural Resources Atlas. Hopefully you've been able to take some tools away from this that you can use in your own applications. Again, if you need to reach me or have some questions or comments or whatever, um, you can use the contact us form in this web document. I do receive those emails. Or you can email directly at eric.angstrom at state.vt.us. So I want to thank everyone for joining me. We've had 150 plus attendees here, so it was a great showing. Hopefully you're all able to uh, hear me and, and see what I was doing and, and um, take this and use it in your own work. So um, thank you again. I appreciate it, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks.